Amen. Amen. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, and welcome to all of you wonderful college people. And I know by now you have a whole lot of homework, and you're here anyway, so we're glad to see you. Thankful that you're here. And all of you, a Sunday night crowd is an encouraging thing at our church. I know there are a lot of things to do, and uh, you're here because it's a priority, and I thank God for that. If you have your copy of God's Word, would you turn, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 4. We'll read the first eight verses of 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, last Sunday night, uh, on Tuesday at noon, uh, last Wednesday night, and then again tonight, I'm speaking from the second letter of the Apostle Paul to Timothy. Now, I, I know that you can't say one part of God's Word is more wonderful than another part of God's Word, but there's a real sense in which I feel like I'm walking in especially sensitive and wonderful territory here. I don't know of anyone who demonstrated more of what it means to know Jesus Christ than did this man Saul of Tarsus, whom we call the Apostle Paul. And we're reading tonight uh, probably the last thing he wrote in his life. Uh, some people say that it was just a few days after he penned uh, this second letter to Timothy that his life was taken from him because he had committed the hideous crime of telling the world about Jesus Christ. And so these are, these are especially holy words, I think. And he is very anxiously giving a crash course, saying the last things to Timothy that he wanted to say to him. He had left Timothy in his most important work, the church in Ephesus. Uh, there was no greater, a shining, and important city, I guess, in human history in that part of the world than Ephesus. This trade route, this wealthy place, this city that literally stole the librarian and, and stole the literary reputation away from Alexandria as the, as the place of the seat of learning and the place of science in the world of their day. In the church at Ephesus, Paul spent more than a lot of time there beginning this church, and he left that church with Timothy. And people have said that Timothy is the kind of fellow who's a good number two man, but not a good number one man. I, I have problems with that. I think anybody who serves the Lord Jesus Christ is a number two person. He has to be the number one person in, in all of our lives. But they're saying that Timothy is timid and he needs direction and he needs guidance and Paul is giving him these last instructions and first and second Timothy are really manuals in how to serve the Lord Christ and what to do in church and how to make a church work and it's a, it's a wonderful thing. I consider first and second Timothy my job descriptions and I believe there really are that. But the apostle is this man, he's talking to Timothy in these, in these paragraphs about courage, about having the courage it takes to serve the Lord, about understanding that comfort is not always what happens when you follow the Lord Jesus Christ. That the people have been telling you that if you really love Christ, you'll never be sick and you'll always be rich and everything will be wonderful and everything will be great have been lying to you or the Apostle Paul's life was a farce because he suffered much. He struggled much. He was killed for following Jesus Christ. He is the picture of courage. Somebody said you, you put him in a bunghole, he'd preach Christ, or put him in a barrel, he'd be, cry, preach Christ out of the bunghole. They said if you put him in a prison, he'd come out of that prison with a jail door under one arm and a convert under the other. He, he turned what some people call defeat into victory because he did know whom he had believed and was persuaded that he was able to keep that which he had committed unto him against that day. Those were Paul's words we sang just a little while ago. And he writes to Timothy about courage, about being a person, following the Lord. And these are words from one minister to another, but they literally are words to anyone who wants to follow Christ and count for him. In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men or people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth 
and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Now in these lines is given the recipe for effective service of the Lord Christ. And in verses 1 and 2 and verse 5, we're told what it takes to do a work for the Lord Christ that's going to make a difference in this world. First of all, there must be a commitment to and a belief in the living Lord. Uh, some people approach Bible study as though God used to do great and wonderful things, that he long ago used to open red seas, he used to heal people, he used to do things. He was at one time a powerful God. Some people talk about God of the God who was. Other people seem to go into the other ditch and talk about that one day God's going to do some great things, that some of these days God's going to come back and all sorts of wonderful things are going to happen. And so they talk of the God who one day is going to do some great and wonderful things, and he is. But if you're going to be effective in your service for the Lord Christ, you have to have a now attitude about the power and presence of the Lord. He says here, in the presence... Timothy, in the presence of God and Christ Jesus who will judge the living and the dead and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. He said, you need to know that we are now in the presence of the Lord Christ and God the Father. That we are, if we are empowered, we are empowered by the Spirit of God. That God is in the here and now. He is with us here and you must know that. But also he is the God who is coming and he's coming to judge. He's coming to judge the works of his people who have said that they know him and who are given the opportunities and the privilege to serve him. He talks about his kingdom, of the Christ who will come and will judge and will stand before him and give account for the way we've given our lives. And so he says, Timothy, if you're going to have an effective service for the Lord Christ, know for sure that God is alive, he is real, he is here, and he is coming, and you're going to give an account of how you've lived your life for his glory and for his honor. That's the first ingredient of effective ministry. The second is we must know not only that there is a living Lord, but there is an infallible word. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Tell me, where do you get your idea about how you're going to live your life? Do you buy some self-help book on a, on, a wind, on a store shelf that says this is how you can look beautiful and never have wrinkles and never worry and always be wealthy and everything's going to be great and wonderful and good uh, and it'll cost you nothing? Uh, do you read those kinds of books? Is that where you learn how you're going to do your life and how you're going to get your attitude about living? God's Word is saying this is the infallible guidebook. This is what tells you about life. It is in these pages you will learn what it means to be a person made in the image of God. When Christ comes again, he's not going to ask you if you were as successful as, as Donald Trump. He's not going to ask you if you had the kind of egotism of some of the people that are catching the public eye now. He's going to ask you, have you lived according to this word? Do you believe that this is the word of God? That it is through this word that you can get instruction, that you can be rebuked when you do wrong, that this will guide you right, that this will be the thing to lead you and direct you. Where do you get your authority for living your life? And if you're going to have an effective life, it counts for the glory of our Lord Christ. And I would think that if anyone in our church wants to do that, it will be those who are gathered here tonight. If you want to have the effective kind of life, then you will say, I know there is a living Lord and he is here. And I know that there is an infallible guidebook for Christian living. And this is the word of God. And this is how I will read and discover what I am to be and what my attitude is about and what my goals and my life are. This is how I will discover who I am. I am to be, and I will let this guide me. This is God's guidebook, 
It is his word. And then he talks about the other ingredient, of course, if there's going to be effective ministry, there will be one living Lord present in his people. There will be an infallible guide as we look at the word of God and say, this is God's word to me. It really is the word of God for living and life and all. And there will be a submitted servant. There will be an untiring servant. In verse 5, he says, But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministries. Now you say, well, that's talking to you, preacher. That's not talking to me. Do you understand that one of the greatest doctrines, in fact, I guess this is the dominant reason, after having been called to preach before I knew what brand I would be, I think this is one of the dominant reasons I became a Baptist. Because we have a doctrine entitled the priesthood of every believer. Now, people who like to think only of privilege and not of responsibility will say, well, that means that I am a priest and I don't need any preacher to tell me what to do and I don't need anybody to pray for me. I can go directly to God. I am directly in touch with God. I don't need a priest. And that's right. That is right. That's the privilege of a priesthood. But also, a priest is someone who serves others in God's name. A priest is someone who shares the message of God with other people. A priest is someone who ministers to the needs of other people in God's name. We believe that every one of us is a priest. That's one of our basic Baptist Bible doctrines, the priesthood of every believer. And so these words are for all of us. These words are for every one of us, but you keep your head in all situations. Do you understand how sin works? It starts in your head. It starts in your head. You, you open up your head and you tell the world to dump the garbage. You turn on the TV and say, all right, dump the garbage in my head. You read the stuff that you find in newsstands, dump the garbage in my head. You listen to the dirty jokes, dump the garbage in my head. The Word is saying, watch what gets into your head because that's where it all starts. Watch your head. Keep your head. The word could be translated, stay sober, stay alert, stay aware, be on guard as to what gets into your mind. Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. If you have to endure hardship, endure it. It's all right. You'll come on the other side of it. Do the work of an evangelist. The word evangelism, the euangelion, is a word that means to announce Christ. Now, that's important. All of us are to be announcing Christ. And in the first century, they never argued Christ. They announced him. They never debated Christ. They announced him. They just went around announcing Christ. They said, he's real, he's alive, he's in me, he saved me, he can save you. They just made the announcement about the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of us is charged to make that announcement and to, be the, to do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Now, all of us have a different race to run. Paul is going to say in a few minutes, I have run the race. You remember other times he said, I have kept the course, I have finished the course, I have run the race. He's simply saying, I have done the thing God has told me to do. Now, I can't judge your race. I don't know what your race is, just as you can't judge my race. God gives every one of us a race to run. He gives every one of us a work to do. He gives every one of us a calling, a niche, a way that is his will for our lives, for us to fulfill that will and do that thing that God would have us to do. And he's saying to Timothy, run your race. Do the thing that you're supposed to do. Discharge the duties of your ministry. Now, the way the Word of God presents truth is to let you know that everything that God has done is copied by the evil forces in this world. Remember, for the Christ, there's an antichrist. For God, there's the great beast. For the Holy Spirit, there is the great dragon. There, there is a counterfeit on the, on the dark, deep, unspiritual side for every spiritual reality. You know that Satan cannot create anything. Satan cannot create. He can only copy. He can only distort. He can only pervert. One of the reasons, one of the words that is 
Translated sin in your Bible is the word perversion of purpose. I told young people in meetings several years ago that, that every, every drive, every desire you have is God-given. Uh, gambling, my, how it's, it's sad to be a part of a nation where the government gets in the gambling business or, or the government's the one that sells alcohol. That's, that's a pitiful commentary on our government and on us to think that we take this easy way to do things that we don't want to take responsibility for getting done, and so we play on the weaknesses of people, and it's wrong, it's wrong. But you understand that gambling is a penny any perversion of the great instinct of faith. Then you want to know great gamblers, you find some Christian missionary who has bet his or her life that Jesus Christ is Lord and has sent them to Indonesia to give their life living on $1,200 a month for the rest of their lives. That'll show you a gambler. Oh, that's a great gambler. This other junk is just penny ante perversions. You bet your life once that Jesus Christ is Lord and you become one of the world's greatest gamblers and you follow his leading and you believe him and trust him by faith and you're fulfilling that wonderful instinct for enterprise that God gave you. Sex is a drive God gave us. Satan simply perverts it and twists it and makes it wrong when it's a beautiful, wonderful thing that God gave to man and woman in the confines of marriage. Uh, you look at, at everything we do and every drive we have. God gave it. God made it. It's right. But sin perverts it and twists it. And so here the Word is saying, for these three things that, that make an, an effective witness, an effective witness for the glory of God, this living Lord, this infallible Word, and this in, untiring servant to serve the Lord, the thing that makes a witness ineffective, that makes a religion ineffective is what he brings now in, verse, in verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound interest or with sound doctrine. And so instead of having a living Lord, they'll come up with something else. They'll say, he's not alive. You do the best you can. You, you do as well as you can. You don't have to trust in him. You don't have to do his will. The Lord is not alive. They'll come up, they won't put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And so they say, we don't believe in an infallible word. We don't believe this is the truth of God. We work things out for ourselves. And, and our great battle cry in our church is not the Bible says, but rather it sings to me. And so this is how it becomes ineffective. There's no authority there. There's no real doing there, and there is not the kind of committed servant. Instead, the members say, well, if they don't say what I want to say, then I'm going to walk out. If they don't do it the way I want to do it, they can't count on me. I, well, I know what I like, and I know what I want to hear, and I know what I want church to be like, and if it's not fun, if it doesn't make me feel good, then I'm going to go find some place that's fun, makes me feel good. All this kind of thing is just simply saying that there is not a commitment to what the Lord will hear. It says they turn their ears away from truth and turn aside to myth. So for every real thing that is effective for the Lord, there is an unreal thing that makes churches ineffective and almost comical, that's, that's, the, that's the rebellion of, of indifference there. But Paul says to Timothy, as you find yourself being faithful, then you understand the reward is coming. And here's his testimony. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also unto all who have longed for his appearing. Isn't that amazing? That the same people who may not have accomplished anything the way we look at things being accomplished, and, but yet long to see Jesus are going to get the same crown as the Apostle Paul that those who are longing for the appearing of Christ and long to serve him and long to do his will are going to be just as rewarded as the Apostle Paul with all of his scars and all of his days of imprisonment and all of the hard work and study and letters he wrote and things that he suffered and the death he died as a martyr for Christ. Those who love the Lord Christ and are looking forward to seeing him will receive the same kind of, of reward. Paul, as he's writing to Timothy, is living in anticipation for this 
Isn't it a wonderful thing to come down to the last years of your life and live in anticipation for a better thing that's coming? And yet that's what God has in store for those who serve him faithfully and honor him with their life. They anticipate the reward, and one day the reward will come. I read years ago about a, an old missionary couple coming back after having served many, many years in poverty and uh, giving up a lot of things to serve Christ in a foreign land. They came in on a cruise ship as they were coming back across the ocean. That's the only way to travel in those days. When they got there, there was a, a great crowd waiting at the dockside. There were streamers and there was a band and apparently there were somebody being honored. And, and when they got off the boat, they, they noticed that these people were honoring some famous actor who had come back from overseas and they were meeting them. And I guess the man thought for a while there that they were going to honor him. He looked a little down. And there was no one there to meet them. And no one there to say, you did a good job and what a wonderful service you've given your life to. And the man's wife turned to him and said, it's all right, honey. We're not home yet. We're not home yet. But when they get home, when they went to heaven, that reward and that greeting would be there for them. That's when they would be home. I, I hope that all of us can take seriously that this life is so fleeting and short and opportunity is, is ours. There's so much we could do if we wanted to, so much we could do for him. The recipe for the effective service is there. It's just a matter of believing that Jesus Christ is alive and he's here and he's coming again and one day we'll give an account for how we've served him. It's believing with all of our souls that he tells us what he wants us to know in this word and this is God's truth, not some interesting book to study, but a guideline to live by and to work by and to share. And that as we will be faithful, as we will run the race he's given us, as we, as we will announce Christ to our world, as we will be the people he's given us to be, then the reward is coming for us. We can look all around us and see the ineffectiveness of people who have lost the convictions about those three basic things, about the living Lord, about the living word, and about the living of their lives to the glory of God. May that not be true of you and me. Father, I thank you for your love and for your grace. I thank you for the privilege of being a part of a fellowship like this. And I thank you that you make life joyous and happy in service. That those who seek joy seldom find it. That those who seek you always find it. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for the opportunity to be yours. And lead us now in this time, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You're invited. We invite you to be a part of this fellowship. We'd like to ask you when the song is sung just to stand up. Everyone will remain seated during the invitation, but if you need to make public decision, just stand up and walk forward and we'll greet you and be happy about your coming to announce your decision to follow Christ, to schedule your baptism, to be a part of this church family, and we welcome that, to rededicate your life perhaps, to let us know God has called you for a particular task so we can pray for you and rejoice in that. Whatever's happening in your life that would honor and please God with public decision, I pray you'll do that just now. We're going to sing, and Rob, what is the number? Number 296 is a hymn of invitation. Let's sing that together, and you come now and make whatever commitment would honor him. Uh -huh.